Hello everyone, my name is Volterra. I'm currently rewriting uh, Krita's text tool. And in this presentation, I'm going to talk to you about how I approach this project. First, I'm going to explain why this was necessary. And for that, I'm going to go through a very brief history of uh, Krita's various text tools. Uh, then I'm going to explain how I split up the projects. And uh, finally, I'm going to show off some of the UI features and explain how we designed them and how we came up with their precise usage. So first, a bit of history. Uh, once upon a time, Krita had two text tools. And that was because within the Caligra suite, uh, programs could share code with one another. So Krita, which was part of the suite, uh, shared its first text tool with Caligra Words, the word processor, and its second text tool with Carbon, the vector application. Both of these text tools had their own text layout and could do different things, but neither of them integrates very well with Krita, and that was mainly because they were really part of these other programs. When Krita split off from the Caligra suite, uh, we also had to duplicate all of this code so when we started on the uh, vector overhaul for 4.0, we mainly wanted to switch from ODG to SVG as our internal file format, but we also wanted to get rid of these two text tools and replace them with uh, a single text tool. This new text tool uh, was going to be a lot simpler. It was just going to be used based on uh, Q text layouts and was going to have a little window where people could to type text in, and then in the future, people could extend it, right? So this didn't really work out. Like, we managed to create this text tool, and we managed to release it, but we never really managed to extend it. The largest problem here was that uh, queue text layouts the, the code wasn't very accessible to us, and it also did not support all the features we need. So it were, every time a programmer came in and said, well, I'm going to fix a text tool, they'd uh, go in to the code, and a week later, they'd show back up and say, yeah, this is impossible. There's too much that needs to be changed. So this effectively uh, prevented all work uh, being done on the text tool. And artists had to deal with a very clunky UI for the next five years. Okay. Fast forward to 2022, we had a roadmap discussion. And uh, in the year before that roadmap discussion, I'd been working, uh, I'd been studying uh, how other people had been doing the text tool. I've been studying how uh, other programs had been doing uh, their text layouts. So at the 2022 roadmap discussion, I present my findings and people were like, okay, well, Tara, you're going to do the text tool. The year after that, uh, I spent it on rewriting the text layout, shifting away from uh, queue text layouts and using a base of uh, Rackham, Halfboss, FreeType and the Unibreak. I managed to, uh, yeah, I managed to support most of uh, the SVG features. I managed to get wrap around text working. And in the meanwhile, I also started the Krita uh, UI uh, design process, which starts with asking artists how they plan to use the thing. Um, and so in my case, I specifically asked them, hey, what exactly do you expect from this text tool? I started this thread on Krita Artists and I got a lot of useful feedback. And all of this feedback, as well as the lessons I've learned from, uh, the, uh, uh, from the one year of working on a text layout, was uh, collected into a, a huge document of 5,000 words, uh, which also contained uh, problems, uh, future developments, things we had to keep in mind, and a lot of UI mockups. I then discussed uh, this plan with uh, my fellow contributors to Krita, 
And from this, a free phase project uh, was developed to, uh, yeah, in which the text tool would be created. Uh, each of these phases uh, would be doing a uh, deep refactor type of thing to keep the code nice and usable, while also having a part of it that had user-facing changes. And this was because um, I felt that people had been very patiently waiting for a new text tool, and I wanted to make sure that uh, each time I went in to change uh, the underlying code, there would be also user-facing changes. So they still they had the feeling that uh, some progress was being made. So phase one is uh, on canvas plain text editing. Uh, the deep uh, rework that is required was uh, actually uh, teaching the text layout what cursor positions are, as well as uh, yeah, as well as actually getting the editing to work, getting undo uh, stage to work. Uh, phase two of this uh, had. Uh, is the rich text ed editing, which is what I'm working on right now. And the uh, yeah, the, the refactoring part of this is, is that the data structure had to be rewritten because uh, the original data structure was a tree of pointers, which is very annoying for my, for to, to memory manage. So we've uh, switched it away to a tree of uh, structs that um, so that we don't have to deal with memory management so much. It was still a pretty intense refactor, uh, but now we don't have to uh, worry about memory leaks. And uh, I'm currently working on actually getting the UI to work properly. The final phase uh, will involve uh, a so-called typesetting mode. And uh, this is just a fairly advanced feature after the first two phases, the text tool will uh, be already very usable. So this third phase is uh, just extra niceness to uh, finish it all off. And uh, after two years of working on it, it works. So now that the jig is up, let's take a look at the UI. The first phase was uh, on canvas text editing. This was uh, the feedback of this was quite interesting in that there was no feedback at all. So um, I had to spend a lot of time studying other programs like how do they handle cursor movements, uh, specifically um, how do they handle selections, how do they handle uh, going uh, to the uh, start of a sentence to the end of a sentence of these shortcuts, uh, I had to study how um, different uh, writing modes, when a program supported this, uh, how the cursor movement was handled on those. I spent a significant amount of time trying to get the uh, corrects, so the, the, the text cursor, to work right. Uh, for example, in ligatures, it uh, sits between uh, the different parts of the ligature and when the text is italic, it will slant along. Uh, bidirectional text uh, gets a little text flag to show where the next character is going to be placed. Um, and finally, uh, one of the things that was uh, really uh, important to us was trying to get input methods to work. Uh, because we have quite a few uh, East Asian users, which is also why we really wanted to make sure that we uh, could allow for vertical text uh, layout. And uh, with an input method, so I'm using IBUS here, um, a East Asian uh, language user can uh, just use a QWERTYOPS keyboard to type uh, their the the phonetic the Latin phonetic equivalent of um, uh, their words, and not just have the phonetic characters uh, show up for the for that specific uh, uh, culture, but also being able to choose between alternatives that they 
that they meant instead. So support for this was is part of huge sort of, uh, but because I had to uh, type uh, or because um, of the the whole editor is uh, completely on canvas and is kind of separated from Qt. I had to manually take all of the parts uh, that Qt offers for uh, input method support and uh, tie it in manually. Uh, um, this is also going to be uh, important on Android later because uh, this is how the virtual keyboards on mobile phones is, is implemented. Another thing, some things that were kind of um, unexpected, but that I ended up implementing anyway, uh, was uh, I've Im improved the uh, speed of uh, text. Oh, yeah, because uh, this is still on the... Uh... Text, because um, the vectors were a little slow, so I spent a few weeks on uh, trying to speed it up, so uh, the feedback was instantaneous. Uh, I also spent some time on uh, getting all these little lines you see here, like these uh, dashed lines and, of course, the cursor itself, to be um, 4K compatible, because uh, one of the feedbacks we got when I was testing this with users was that uh, one user couldn't see uh, the, the uh, decorations, as we call them. So I went through all of Krita's decorations and made them um, high DPI compatible. Uh, finally, I also implemented a uh, paint order. The thing is, is that when you're um, working with fonts, the, um, um, sometimes a glyph might be made up of multiple parts. This is very common with uh, variable fonts, but also very common with uh, joints. And if you then make an outline and draw it on top of everything, this is a bug, uh, then it's, uh, it looks really strange because it shows that this little outline, uh, the, or that this, this glyph is made up of multiple outlines. So if you put it, if you put the outline behind the uh, text, or behind the fill of the text, um, it just looks much more, be much better, uh, and is much more readable in general. So all of this took about uh, half a year in total. Uh, there was a lot of fiddliness, a lot of trying to get uh, the undo states to work just right, and um, yeah, I I hope. I didn't miss anything of this. So then, going to the next part. So, for the second phase, rich text editing. This is the phase I'm currently in. I got a lot of feedback. Uh, artists were very split about where they wanted to have the text properties. Some of them wanted them to have it in a context menu, while well, others wanted to have it uh, in a Docker. And this is very much a split between people who work with big workstations where the Dockers are very far from the center of the screen and people who work uh, with uh, laptops where uh, the Dockers are very much uh, in the within the field of vision. In the end, it had to be a Docker because if I'm using the text tool to select something, uh, I can only select one um, object at a time. And this was a problem because what all the artists did agree on was that they want to be able to edit multiple text objects at the same time. Which is now possible because the text properties are in a Docker, so we can select multiple text properties and with uh, the shape selection tool and uh, change their font features. The second bit of feedback that we got that I thought was pretty interesting was not too many properties, please. And when I asked this person, is that because it's annoying that you can't find the properties that you need? Or is it because it's 
intimidating. They respond with, it's intimidating. And having seen many different uh, text property dockers in different programs, I can't help but agree. So before I explain how we're solving this, I first need to explain a um, UI habit we have within Krita is, is that uh, within Krita we try to keep uh, the UI unblocking. And to show that, I'm going to try to transform this layer. And I'm going to let's see, skew it. And then even though the transformation is still ongoing, when I switch back to a different tool, the transform applies. And the reason behind this is, is that um, we don't need to show a confirmation dialog asking, do you really want to apply this transform? Because the user can just undo it. So going back to the text properties, the way we solve the problem of too many properties is that we only really show the ones that are currently being applied, and as well, when we select the text, the ones that are currently being inherited, as with uh, CSS inheritance. People can then add properties and set them and just remove them. And uh, so this is a non-blocking shift. People can just set a property that they can see and remove them when it turns out it doesn't make them happy. So this is important because there's about 50 properties and we cannot expect artists to remember what each property does. And most importantly, they, we cannot expect them to remember what the default setting was of each property. So if people can just take an option, toggle it, and then decide that, no, this is scary, I want it to go away, then it, the text properties docker should be uh, a lot more safe to explore. And that way, uh, it will also be a lot more fun to explore the different options instead of it uh, being intimidating and also getting in your way. So other than that, um, there's still one major usability feature missing. Namely, this is uh, style presets. And that's because uh, with about 50 properties to change, you don't you want to allow people to store their favorite property combinations. Uh, as I'm still working on this phase, uh, I can't show any of that, but it's definitely in the cards. So then we go to. So for the last phase, the advanced features, um, I haven't started this phase yet, uh, but one of the things that um, I want to work on was typesetting mode. And uh, the idea for typesetting modes uh, also came from artists' feedback. Some of the artists were saying um, like, oh, it would be very good if we had like on canvas uh, ways to set the line height and uh, the letter spacing. Well, other artists were saying, no, please don't do this because uh, it will interfere with writing. And as I kept listening to what they, these artists were saying, it started to dawn on me that there's basically uh, two types of text tool. And each of them has a uh, kind of a separate use case. So the primary uh, type is text editing. Uh, you just add a text and maybe you want to set things bold. Well, the other uh, type of text tool is uh, more of a typesetting mode where you don't really want to type anything. You just copy it in from a brief and you uh, change the fonts and try to fine tune the spacing and try to work on the kerning and everything. And uh, in most programs, the, both of these just kind of get squished into one uh, single tool, but they are obviously uh, kind of conflicting, uh, especially because uh, 
toggles on screen might interfere with text editing, while maybe something uh, that would be useful to useful to text editing, namely um, autocorrect uh, decorations, would probably interfere with typesetting. So um, for that reason, I want to work on typesetting mode. Uh, the typesetting mode will also uh, help us uh, conceive of what to do exactly with some of the advanced SVG 1.1 features, because SVG 1.1 allows you to move every character individually. And uh, that is incredibly powerful, but there hasn't been any uh, tool that has really uh, given artists control the ability to actually choose those things. Uh, other things that I'm slightly worried about is the uh, baseline alignment feature, which can be very abstract, but uh, is very useful when trying to uh, decide uh, what you're going to do with uh, text of different uh, sizes. Because, uh, let's see. No, let's demonstrate that for a bit. Yeah, alignment baseline. Because you can technically, so the default baseline is the alphabetic one for, especially for uh, al alphabetic text, but maybe you want to center it instead. Or maybe you want it hanging, which is uh, useful for um, uh, the North Brahmic scripts like uh, Devnagari. Um, yeah, so, but this is a very abstract feature, right? You don't really understand uh, what you're looking at. So for that, for these kind of abstract features, I wanted to um, introduce uh, some on-canvas decorations so that uh, people should be able to see what exactly they're selecting. And then it should be a lot less uh, abstract. But this all needs to go into a typesetting mode because all of these uh, extra visuals uh, will be um, will be very uh, overwhelming for someone who just wants to type some text in their, into their comic. Um, other than that, uh, after I've got all of this done, uh, I want to go back into the text layout and uh, figure out text orientation, which is uh, a control to allow uh, for uh, the mixing of vertical and uh, horizontal text, uh, which happens a lot in um, a vertical text layout. Um, and I want to work on some other East Asian features as well as having better color font support. But I think I don't think that um, those will be in Krita 5.3. For 5.3, I just want, mostly want to get uh, the whole text tool to work, and it's still going to be a lot of work. Um, but um, I hope that despite of all of its complexity, uh, I will be able to make it a fun to use tool for people that uh, allows them to access every single feature that they need. Um, so yeah, this was my presentation. I hope you learned something from it and uh, I'll be looking forward uh, to hearing your questions.